Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks this morning. This is the day that you have made. We are rejoicing and we are glad in it. Thank you, Lord, because the scripture says that the entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. Lord, I ask that you will speak to us this morning. You will give us light. You will give us understanding in the things that we need to know. The Bible says that the word did not do them good because the word did not mix with faith in your heart. I say that shall not be our portion this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. That your word will mix with faith in our hearts in the mighty name of Jesus. And on every side, we'll be blessed because we came in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, speak expressly. We, your servants, are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We're starting a new series as we read through the Bible this year. And we're going into major prophets. The major prophets in the Bible, it's not because they are in any way the best prophets or the big prophets. The reason why the Bible refers to them as major prophets is because of the length and the complexity of what was covered in those books. And when we talk about the major prophets in the Bible, we are looking at, we're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Ezekiel and Daniel. In Isaiah, we've got 66 chapters. In Jeremiah, we've got 52. In Lamentations, we've got five. In Ezekiel, we've got 48. And in Daniel, we've got 12. It just shows you how big it is. Whereas when you look at the minor prophets, they just cover maximum of 14 chapters in them. All through the book of Isaiah, Isaiah covers extensive prophecies on judgment, redemption, and the coming of the Messiah. In Jeremiah, it focuses on detailed warnings, including judgment and also personal narratives. In Lamentation, it talks about the poetic ref reflections of Jerusalem's fall. And when you go to the book of Ezekiel, it talks about symbolic visions Prophecies, judgment, and restoration. And you go to Daniel, it talks about the narrative story and the complex apocalyptic visions. The end time is covered in that book. But one thing you will see when you look at the major prophets is the fact that the running theme across the major prophets is the story of judgment and restoration. The running theme across all of them is the fact that God is a God of what? Judgment. God is a just God. And God is a God of restoration. So if you don't get anything, just remember that. The theme that runs across all the five Major prophet is the fact that our God is a God of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. There is a judgment day what? Coming. There is a judgment day what? Coming. You know, where everything that we've done, everything that we are doing, and everything that we'll do, we will give account for them. And the fact that God is a just God, I know at times it's a word that people don't like to say. But it's the truth. The fact is, God, because at times you say, 
God is a God of love. How would God do that? But the fact is, he's a just God. He's a God of judgment. So don't forget that. It's a running theme. You see it in Isaiah. You see it in Jeremiah. You see it in um, um, Ezekiel. But when you look at, when you read, normally what I try to do, like when I did, um, oh, sorry, not that one. What I try to do is to read all the chapters in the Bible, or if I'm preaching on a particular subject, say I'm preaching on um, Ecclesiastes, I'll probably read all the chapters, but there's no way I could have covered 66 plus 40, 52 plus 48 plus 5 plus 12. So, but I've read it before, and I believe that some of you have read it before. So we're just going to go through it together in a, in a, as we go through this morning. But one thing you will see is the fact that God sent his prophet to warn his people at different times over different things, saying, look, if you don't turn from this way that you are on, this is what I'm going to do. Or telling them about what is going to happen in the years to come. In the book of Isaiah, it talks about, it prophesied about the coming of Jesus Christ, and we saw that Jesus came. In the, in the book of Daniel, it's talking about the things that are yet to happen. Some of them we are seeing now. In the book of Ezekiel, it talks about prophecies, judgment that's going to come. Why do I say all of this? I'm saying this because God is a God that is long-term view. Our God does long. Our God thinks long. Our God plays the long game. I mean, who saw the game yesterday? It was a long game, innit? You know, but at some point, every game will come to an end. But there's time. God is, for some of us this morning, God is nudging you about something. God is nudging you about something. God is playing the long game. He's reminding you of some things. Or God will remind you of some things. God plays the long game. God thinks long. Ends at different times. He kept reminding the Israelites that they've heard. Calling them back. If you don't stop this thing that you're doing, this is what I'm going to do to you. Imagine God speaking through the prophet and saying, look, just go into the temple. And look at what the elders of the church are doing. That if they don't turn from this evil way, this is what's going to happen to them. God warning the Israelites that they've heard, sending prophets to warn them and give them a path to, rest, to restoration. Not just telling them they've heard, but giving them a path to restoration. Don't forget that I said that one, the major theme in all the major prophets is the fact that he's a God of what? Judgment and restoration. I'm going to read 2 Peter 3 9. It's not coming up on the screen. 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness. But God is what? Long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come what? To repentance. God is what? Long-suffering. God is what? Long-suffering. And it's not, it, it's, it's, not his, it's not his will to see anyone perish, but he's giving each and everyone a long rope. Playing the long games means, or part of it is that, you are patient. You are delaying gratification. You are not overwhelmed by short-term gains. I think it was last week I was watching a documentary, and I've said this to a few people that I've... I mean, my story is such that uh, if I find something... 
my wife will tell you this, or my kids will tell you this. If I find a new song, I will play it till the cows come home. It's like, can you not just stop playing this? I will play it till there's a song I found uh, when uh, last week. I forgot what it's about now. Um, and it was my wife and I in the room. Um, and I played the song once. I, I knew I was, I played it again. It's like, can you don't stop that thing? <laughs> But that's, that's, just, that's, just the way I, that's just the way I go. But the point here is, I watched this documentary, and for as many that have been around me for the last few days, I've spoken about it. The documentary is about longevity, how to live a long life. And um, this guy was talking about how it's a multi-billion dollar industry the gym, the medications, the tabs, and everything that people, you know, take. But the point is, everybody wants to live long, but not everybody wants to pay the price to live long. Everybody wants to get, we've all been given an opportunity to live a long life, to live a fulfilling life, but not everybody wants to pay that price. And even when you want to pay that price, the environment you find yourself at times doesn't allow you to do that. And the guy was saying, longevity is not what you do once. And you think, it's like saying, I go to the gym. You do it once, it's not going to give you that chiseled body. <laughs> I saw a skit the other day. Somebody said, look, I've, um, I'm going to the gym, and I want, to, I want to collect my money back. I paid for membership and I want to call my money back. And it's like, no, it's not the fact that you paid, it's the fact that you didn't, you're not going. That's why, you have, that's why you don't have the body. The point there is, it's not longevity, it's not what you do once, it's what you do on a consistent basis. It's also, the guy also stressed the point that, you, when you look at the documentary, it talks about the fact that there's a, there's a, there's a part a community plays in how long you go, or how, effective you're, or, or how effective you become over time. But the point here is, we all have the potential. We were all created to go long, but not many attain it. Like I said at the very beginning, the theme of the major prophet is an interplay of judgment and restoration. Nothing has changed in God's mind regarding that. You and I, this church, churches together, the body of Christ in general, we are all being given that unique ministry. We are all part of that ministry of bringing, of relaying the judgment of God and the restoration of God. I will say that again. You and I, CPC as a church, your group, your family, if you believe in God, the church as a whole, have been employed, have been called into that ministry of relaying the judgment of God and the restoration of God. As long as you've said at one point or the other that you claim, you believe Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've been co-opted into that ministry. You've been called to be that. Hence, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19, he says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and as what? Committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So there's no getting out of it. Whether you like it or not, as long as you say you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God, or you are the daughter of Zion, you are been called into the ministry of reconciliation. We are 
called to relay the judgment and the restoration of Christ. So God's plan for us as relayed in the major prophets is the fact that we play the long game. So this morning I'm going to break, break it down into um, four parts. When I say long, the L stands for listen to God. There are many voices and there are so many things that, that are available for us to listen to. Some of those voices are unsolicited, you know. They are not called for, they just come. Some of those voices are voices that, based on your history, your search history, or based on the search history of somebody in your family, they pump those things into you, come those, those things come your way. Voices. Somebody searches for something in your house, and all of a sudden, somebody searches for skip, and you find it in your profile when you don't know what is going on. So there are so many unsolicited voices available for us to listen to. Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. That's going to come up on the screen. This is Isaiah talking. It says, and I heard a voice, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to these people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of these people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their, their eyes. Lest the sea with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. It says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, which voice are you listening to? Or when last can you boldly say you've heard the voice of the Lord? Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. This was Jeremiah talking about how when God was talking to him and, his, and was calling him. But despite Jeremiah's doubt about his youth and the fact that he wasn't able to do it, God commands him to speak whatever he commands without fearing, promising him that his presence and his protection will be upon him. But Jeremiah still had to listen to what? the voice of the Lord. God was still talking to him. The question is, who are you listening to? What are you listening to? Or when are you listening to it? Ezekiel 2, 1 to 3, and also verse 11. If you're writing notes, it's fair. It's not going to come up on the screen because there's so many scriptures. God was calling Ezekiel to be his prophet to a rebellious Israel. Despite their likely resistance, Ezekiel is still instructed to listen to God and deliver this message. My O stands for obedience. Obedience is not the fact that you've listened to God. Obedience is not the fact that you know what God is saying. Obedience is not the fact that you've heard it too many times. Obedience is what? What you actually do about what you know. Because there are so many things we know. There are so many messages going around. There are so many things. In fact, if you want to sit down in your house on a Sunday morning and listen to all prophets, prophets, you know, everything, there are so many things we can listen to. That's not the problem now. The problem we have now is obedience. It's not the availability of messages or prophets to listen to. The problem we have now is what? Obedience. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 to 6, Daniel had the opportunity. He was in exile. Him and his friend were in exile. He had the opportunity to eat whatever is presented to him. There was nobody to tell him, you don't have to do this. But because he knew 
what God said concerning eating things like that. He said, look, I'm not going to eat this. He could have done it. There was nobody watching. It was behind closed doors or whatever you want to call it. But because he knew what God said, he knew what God demands of him. He said, I'm not going to eat this. But think about this. Daniel did not just also, when I use the word obedience, he just, he just didn't say, well, I'm not going to do it, da, da, da. He spoke to the person in authority and said, look, this is what I'm not going to do. Because there's also levels of authority. At times, Christians can be, what's the right word now? You know, it's like, you disrespect authority. Let me put it that way. He said, look, I'm not going to do this, but this is, this, this is the reason why I'm not going to do this. Give me 10 days. And he obeyed God. And we know what happened afterwards. The Bible says he's counting. It says after 10 days, he and his friends appeared better than those who ate the royal food. But why did that happen? He obeyed. Obeying when no one is looking. Obeying when you recall or know God's standard. You know, there are so many things we say in church. And it's like, no, it's, it's not, it's scriptural. We've seen it from the Bible. We know what it says. What kind of example can I give now? Don't live together before you get married. Let me, that's what readily comes to my mind. And people want to reason that out. People want to argue that out. You know, for whatever reasons, you can give a justified reason, oh, we're going to be married anyway, so why not? But there's a reason behind it. There is a reason behind it. I can go on and I'll stop there. I don't want to get into anybody's business. <laughs> <coughs> Daniel chapter, sorry, Je Jeremiah 13, 1 to 11. God commanded Jeremiah to wear a belt and then bury that belt in a crevice. This was symbolizing how Israel and Judah have become spoiled and worthless because they disobeyed God. This passage emphasizes that just as the belt was ruined by neglect, disobedience to God rendered us, renders us ineffective and separated from him. You know, most times we want to cover our disobedience with sacrifice. Most times we want to cover our disobedience with sacrifice. It's like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, so I must be. But the scripture is clear. It says obedience is what? My end stands for never give up. You know, you've listened to God. You are obeying God. And things are not working out the way you, have, you believe it to be. You know, there's so many things we say, in, you know, there's so many things we do in church. At times, we paint God like he's a, he's a slot machine that every prayer he will answer. Yes, but there are some times that you prayed about some things and it, it just doesn't happen. I experienced this very, very early in my, in my Christian work. And in it, I nearly gave up at that time. But my mom was sick. It was a few years into, into my work of faith. And it's like, I believe that, in fact, that night, I, I came back home from uni that, that night. And through the night, I kept praying, praying for her, lay my hands on her, anoint her, pray for her, pray for her. And I went back, I went back, home, I went back to uni only to be called a few hours after that she had gone. And I remember being told, I mean, for those of you from African origin, nobody told me, they just brought me back home, sat me down, and they told me that she's, I couldn't get my head around it. It's like, how can the God that I believe in, the God that I did all of that, and this is what happened. 
And there will be stories like that. I bet some of you have gone through seasons like that. When you've listened to God, you've obeyed God, and something happens. Never give up. Never give up. Prolonged obedience with delayed performance is a temptation to give up. Prolonged obedience with delayed performance is a temptation to give up. But I pray you don't give up in Jesus' name. I'm just going to quickly round up. Catherine Coleman. How many know? How many people know Catherine Coleman? This will show people's age now. <laughs> yeah, Uncle, oh, Uncle Femi, Auntie Tony. Uh, let me see the people that know Catherine Coleman. Okay, okay, okay. Old school, old school. Oh, <laughs> Christine knows Catherine Coleman as well. Okay, all right. So you can preach the message for me. Basically, Catherine Coleman. Jonathan, do you know Catherine Coleman? <laughs> it's over there, please. But basically, she was um, um, a very a world-renowned healing evangelist in the 60s through 70s. And um, when she died in 1970-something, she never had a child, was married and divorced. She was married... She married an evangelist, and the marriage lasted 10 years. So for 28 years after her marriage, for 28 years, she still stayed in the ministry. But, you know, at times, the way we look at God, we look at God from one perspective. I say all of that to say that she could have given up, or some people think about God and think out like, well, if I don't have this, then I won't serve God. Or I'm not complete without this. No. She still did everything that God expects of her. Purpose is greater than present. Purpose of God for your life is greater than the present that God will ever give you. Everything else is the present. Everything else, I would rather the purpose, I would rather fulfill the purpose of God, which is what she did. We still talk about that today. Some people probably have 10 kids in our time, but let's take our eyes away from those things. If you don't have them, it's fine. If you have them, praise God, but they don't define you. The purpose of God, the purpose of God, never give up. Let purpose drive you and not present. The last one, grace. If you are actively growing in grace, you are inevitably moving. If you are not actively growing in grace, you are inevitably moving backwards in your spiritual journey. The worship team can come up. If you are not actively growing in grace, you are inevitably moving backward in your spiritual journey. Because when you've listened to God, when you're obeying God, and you never give up, in walking towards expanding or being an agent for his justification, for his judgment, and also his restoration, one thing that you have to do is to make sure that you grow in grace. Because you cannot afford to be stagnant. You cannot afford to stay where you are. Daniel chapter 9 from verse 1 to 19 says, talks us about the fact that Daniel studied the prophecies of Jeremiah and realized that 70 years of desolation for Jerusalem are nearly over. And he humbly prayed, confessing Israel's sin, and pleading for God's mercy and restoration. This passage highlights growing in grace by diligently seeking God, acknowledging our sins, 
and relying on his mercy and, prof and, and promises. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary. A young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 2 Peter 3 verse 18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. What I've said this morning is to remind us of the fact that we've been called to relay the judgment and the restoration of God. And in doing that, you need to listen to God. You need to obey God. And in the process of doing that, that you should never give up, that you should grow in grace. How do you grow in grace? How do you endure to the end? Make sure that you you know, your spiritual disciplines, there's nothing lacking in them. When we call prayer and fasting, make sure you, you plug into it. Because no man is a liner. If you want to go far, you do it with people around you. As the worship team was singing, we were singing, in the um, we speak the name of Jesus. You know, I felt very strongly about, you know, when I said never give up, I could imagine that there are some people in the house this morning and it feels that everything is against you. You feel that, I think it was Theodore that said it, it's like, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't understand the bills that I've got to pay. And that song says, I speak Jesus. They're going to sing that song again. If you really need to be prayed for, if you want somebody to speak the name of Jesus into that situation with you this morning or this afternoon, please do not go. As the thing, if you want it, if you want to be prayed for, come, come forward. The prayer team and also the response team will be around to pray for you. But please, don't let this time pass you by. Father, we thank you this afternoon. We exalt your name for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, because you are a good God. Father, we ask, O oh God, that you meet each and every one of us at the point of our need. That, Lord, you will make us listen to you. You will make us, you will help us to, to obey you at every point, every season. We will never give up. We will continue to grow in grace. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray.